So um, I am here from the Museum of Classical Archaeology. We are one of nine University of Cambridge museums and collections uh, that together make the University of Cambridge Museum. See what we did there, the UCM. Uh, rolls off the tongue and um, together as a collective, a little bit like the EU, because we're all separate with our own governance structures, uh, we receive funding from Arts Council England as a national portfolio organisation. And we in the Museum of Classical Archaeology are the smallest of those museums and collections. We are tiny bit players on this grand stage in Cambridge. Um, and like many university museums, we have what is a highly specialist and slightly esoteric collection. Our collection, at least the public face of it, is a large collection of plaster casts. In fact, one of the three largest collections of classical plaster casts in the country to survive <laughs> the trials of the 20th century. Um, and the only one that sits outside of a major national style museum. Um, we also have, we have a lot of shares. We've got about 10,000 shares. We've got some more complete um, ancient artifacts. We've got quite a lot of squeezes too, but it's the plaster casts that I want to focus on today. Um, and that are very much kind of the public face of the collection, right? And plaster casts, plaster casts are weird, right? Replicas, reproductions. I mean, basically, I'm telling you, I've got a collection of fakes, aren't I? They're not fakes. Then I, I, that's my corner, and I, that's the hill I'm willing to die on. But as museum collections go, they're tricky. They're tricky objects, tricky objects to understand and tricky objects to curate. But before I dive into what I said I would talk about today, I want to tell you, I regret my choices today because I looked at, oh, look, I had a slide about the museum. I forgot about that. Sorry, that's my museum. Look, there's a person in my museum. Actually, um, as museum collections, as university museum collections go as well, we're quite a large space. We've got quite a lot of space in our collection. So we're really lucky in that regard, but we would have to, wouldn't we, to have on display plaster casts of this size. I regret my choices today because I looked at what everyone else was talking about and I thought to myself, oh, I could have spoken to you today about our new trail, Beyond the Pale, a trail to bring colour to classics, a trail that is slightly provocatively, I suppose, exploring polychromy and its absence and some of the implications of that that we made last year, working with students, actually, we had a student panel that helped to consult on the content in this trail, um, but also wrote some of the content for it as well. Um, or I could have talked to you about our AHRC funded project where we are using our class because we're working with a sex education freelance specialist to develop sessions aimed at teenagers to use our plaster casts to think about body image and to tackle issues surrounding body image with young people today using the classical bodies that are very much on display and make it in our, in our collection. I could have talked to you about that. But I'm not talking to you about any of those things because what did I decide I would talk to you about today? <laughs> Cataloguing. And not even, not even the type of cataloging research that involves, you know, honest assessment it does involve honest assessment but honest assessment of where your collection has come from um of acquisition historical acquisition practices and repatriation no not that type of cataloging research because my collection is a collection of plaster casts so they don't have source communities it's really unlikely that anyone's going to come banging on our door asking for us to return some plaster casts they have workshops instead um yeah, so great, that's what I decided I would do. Why did I decide I would do that? Largely, I decided that because in many ways, it's when I'm doing cataloging research that it feels the most like I'm doing actual research. So the other stuff, while it deals with difficult issues and sensitive topics, it's kind of fun. It's not to say cataloging is not fun, but the satisfaction that comes from filling in tiny boxes um, in a catalogue is somewhat different. I think we can probably all agree, can't we? But it's the type of thing that feels most like research, to me at least, because it's painstaking, it's time consuming. I'm probably preaching to the converted here, right? Um, and it involves huge piles of books very often. And plaster casts, cataloging plaster casts is somewhat different, I think, and the questions that arise in relation to it are somewhat different than cataloging the original artifacts in our collection. 
they are tricky objects. They are betwixt and between, right? They exist as objects in their own right. They are definitely there in my gallery and God knows they make me know it every single day. Um, but at the same time, they only exist because another object exists somewhere else in the world today. And their meaning and significance comes from the dynamic of their relationship with that object that is not in my collection. I have no responsibility for that object. Um, and that has influenced the way in which our casts have been catalogued and treated in the way in which they've been displayed. Because the status of our objects as cast, ha as cast has shaped their status as museum objects and the information that we keep on them. We do not have good records. You're probably all thinking that. None of us have good records on where our objects came from. Um, but the reasons for that in our collection are because it would never have been considered important to track where we were getting the cast from, which workshops they were coming from or when they were coming in. We did not have um, an accession book. Our accession book has been constructed, retro constructed retroactively, and you'll see some of the problems in that in a moment. Even, that said, I have heard it said that our collection is one of the best recorded collections of cast collections, and that statement itself is probably quite telling, I suspect. Um, so we don't have careful records of acquisitions that we can look at. I haven't got a folder of receipts somewhere and very little record of what was purchased or when. And that's also because for the bulk of the 20th century and certainly by the turn of the 20th century, our collection was very firmly thought of as a teaching collection. So that too kind of absolved the museum committee in a sense of feeling the need to be terribly um, exacting in its record keeping. Um, but although our record keeping has been shaped by the type of objects that we care for, and we're surely not the only museum facing up to these questions about acquisition and ownership, our need to do so is about more than a kind of simple responsibility to know where objects came from, right? So what I want to do today then is take a deep dive to look into how those processes have shaped the historical cataloging of our collection, then think about how we're moving forward to manage that, which is satisfying but slow going, um, and then circle back again to think about why provenance matters in a cast collection beyond spectrum procedures, documentation backlog plans, and sheer bloody mindedness, which I'm pretty sure is what drives me the most, actually. So let's start that deep dive. This is what my old catalogue looks like. <laughs> is it old? I don't know. It's still sort of current in some ways. This is a record that I chose by way of example. You can see number 2A. So it is the third record that I started digging into. And it caused me some surprises. Um, I also chose it today because there's nothing sort of sensitive in that, in that catalog record that I probably shouldn't show to the public. Um, so we have an old, old, old Farmaker Pro catalog in the background. And then what you're also looking at there is like the kind of static web page version of that, that the two are not linked, so they don't talk to each other. So an update in one doesn't affect the other unless you do it manually. Um, and for the most part, the online catalog contains most of the information that is in our regular catalog. Now, if you look closely there at those fields, you might notice very few of those fields relate to the object that is actually in my care. The vast majority of them contain information about the original, the original that I am not responsible for. So uh, thing, I'm pretty sure the size is not an actual measurement of my object. The material definitely is not. Um, anything to do with my object and its age is crammed into the accession of cast field at the bottom. And this poses a problem for me. Um, you might also notice looking closely there that there are some question marks in that accession of cast field and not too many indications of where that information might have come from. So answering these questions involves <laughs> doing a little bit of detective work, really. Um, how can we go about answering where that particular cast might have come from and working out why there's a question over it? There she is, Alxa Goddess. We have a painted version of her and we have an unpainted and unrestored version of her, both of which are plaster casts. Um, the first thing we can do to try and work out where they came from is we can look at the objects themselves. So plaster casts often have maker's marks on them, which is basically a quite literal branding that's added during the kind of making process. In this case, 
The unrestored version has a maker's mark at the back um, on the base. You can see it there. Someone has really helpfully written maybe with biro <laughs> um, a number on the top of it. I don't know if you can quite see there, but you can just make out the word Louvre at the top. So that will tell us where that one came from. Um, we so so we know that we got this from the Louvre then. We also know that we got this in 1922 because my minute books, my committee minute books, tell me that I'm going to come back to that date later. But I wouldn't know it was from the Louvre if it didn't have this maker's mark on it because there's nothing in any of my records anywhere that would tell me that. But it would have been a fair guess because we know that they had a workshop that was producing casts of objects in their collection. So it would have been a fair, fair guess. Lots of casts have maker's marks. We find them all over the place in lots of different workshops. Um, so you can see here, one up here, that's from Berlin, the book's from I in Berlin. This is Malpieri, which is a small dormitory in Rome. Um, the National uh, Atelier in Paris, which is sort of, I believe I want as well, they're linked up. Uh, and then the London one was Bruchani and Co in London. So, we, so makers marks tend to, look different so you can tell them apart. Sometimes they would have had like a little sort of medallion that was inserted. Those are all gone on my cast. I don't know why someone took them away. Uh, what we also sometimes find are these kind of catalogue numbers. So they match up to the catalogue numbers that are specific to each workshop. So theoretically, in the absence of a maker's mark, one might be able to match those numbers up to a specific workshop if one had the time to tackle that particular, and a lot of catalogues from different time periods to tackle that particular, future Suzanne, future Suzanne might do that. Unfortunately, the painted version does not have a lovely maker's mark because that would make life too easy. And in fact, the vast majority of the cars in my collection do not have maker's marks that will tell me where they came from. So instead for this one, we need to turn to the minute books. Uh, there are three, different committee minute notes that um, relate to this. In 1948, the, these, these minutes are also the source of the confusion over where this cast came from. In 1948, the committee expressed a wish to get a cast of the Alcazar Goddess. Now there's no mention here of it being a painted and restored cast. As far as I'm aware, this particular version of the Alcazar Goddess is unique to us, which would suggest it was made specially for us. Um, but since we know we already had one in 1922, since there is no mention of the destruction or loss of that, and since um, there's also no third cast of this knocking about, it's a good guess that in 1948 that was the pursuit of this, of a painted version. Um, in 1951, the outside goddess is mentioned uh, in a list of, a vague list of other casts that are purchased that year. This is number three here, it's one at the bottom. Yes, 1951. But in our catalogue, this minute has been misinterpreted. I don't think the intention of the way this is written is to imply that the cast of the outside goddess was purchased from Copenhagen. Why do I think that? Because Copenhagen's workshop was only supplying casts from the Glyptotech. It wasn't supplying random casts from elsewhere. And just to confirm that, I emailed them and I asked, and they said, yeah, that'd be weird. Have you looked for a maker's mark? <laughs> yes, yes, I had. So we can, we can say we, that by 1951, this was definitely there, but it probably wasn't what my catalog says it may have came from. Um, in 1950, this is the one at the top, just to add to that puzzle, there is a brief mention of agreement to make copies of this cast and another for a professor in London. There is no mention in the committee minutes anywhere of additional cast being made for us or of the supply of another cast, um, of, of the cast that comes in by 1951 being linked to this. But clearly in that particular catalogue note, that's an assumption that has been made there. I guess it could be true that if it were cast taken, if it were a mould taken from our unrestored cast, there'd be a little bit more work going on there, right, to turn it into the restored version, and I'm surprised there's not more mention of that. So there are a tangled web of assumptions sitting behind the acquisition note in our catalogue, um, only the briefest of frustrating mentions and no resolution to this particular problem. 
So where do we go from here? Obviously, the catalogues, our historical catalogues, are not capturing the rich texture of this particular tangle, right? And actually, I think this is one of the great frustrations of cataloging work. You have to reduce things down to sound bites and short mentions that go into tiny little boxes, and you lose a lot of the magic, right, as you do that. And how do you keep that storytelling that, that cataloging has kind of driven you to discover? Um, this is our new catalogue. Doesn't this look nicer? Oh, there are a lot more fields there. Look at that. All of those fields has to be, have to be filled. Someone has to do it. Oh, dear. Um, it's lovely. It's great. So this, is, we are currently developing a new catalogue. It's still FileMaker Pro. It's still purpose-built. And it's based on um, a catalogue that has actually been developed by one of our sister collections, the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. For particular reasons and it's being used by them it's also being used by another of our sister collections the Whipple Museum of Science and we and the Whipple have adapted that basic um, version I suppose uh, for the needs of our our collections and the particular idiosyncrasies of our collections and for the Whipple in particular their history of science they've done a lot of work <laughs> to change an, an archaeology catalogue to work for them. So you can see here immediately the top level um, fields contain way more information that is really accessible. And then, you know, oh, look, keywords, all the basic things that we would expect. And each of those tabs, those blue tabs along the middle of the screen there, uh, represents a different series of fields. But where the magic really happens, <laughs> magic, in this catalogue is here in these two tabs. So the one at the top there is the events tab. Now, what this is designed to do is to create, this is what is, is supposed to be unique about this catalogue. I'm saying that, maybe one of you is going to tell me you've got catalogues that do this too. So what this does is it creates a kind of biography, a life history of an object. So you can add in, you can select different event types. There's all sorts, there's two categories, um, context and description. And within that, there are way more categories there. And you can select a type of object, a type of event, sorry, something that has happened when it was bought, um, when someone published on it, uh, related documents, so archival things that are in your collection. And so long as you give it a date, it will order those chronologically. So it automatically creates a timeline effectively, and you can keep building that up. And for us, that means we can build up a timeline that includes both our object and originals because of that indelible line, right? Um, and if you don't enter a date, then it will just put it right at the top. So like, for instance, for a description of your object. And then also we've added another tab to recognize the uniqueness of our collection, because obviously as much as I don't want to only hold information on someone else's objects, I still want to hold that information. <laughs> So we've got our originals tab, and that is allowing us to um, include the information about both to triangulate basically between our cast and um, the original and to capture information on both. Um, and all of this will ultimately result in a new web online catalogue that will hopefully make our collection way more accessible, both to members of the public, but also to researchers and to students in our own university. Does that make sense? Yeah. And this type of work, trying to fill in all of these different fields, has you know, revealed many fun stories. But one of my favourites here um, is the story of how, for a very brief period between 1973 and 1977, we had not one, not two, but three plaster casts of the Pepper's Corrie. So we got a plaster cast, an unrestored, plain um, plaster cast of the Peplos Quarry at some point between 1889 and 1922. Why those dates, I hear you ask? Well, because in 1898, a catalogue of our collection was published and the Peplos Quarry did not appear in that catalogue. In 1922, the money ran out for buying new plaster casts. So it has to fall in this period somewhere. It won't surprise you to say nothing in my catalogue told me I had to work that out for myself. Um, I, it probably came from Athens, given that the original is there and they were making plaster casts. Um, I can't confirm that though, because I did email them too and they were very nice to me, but they told me that for each year, they only know of the total number of casts of each object that they sent out to countries, not individual collections. They didn't keep that record. So yeah, it probably came from them, but none of us can confirm it. Um, 
1975, we got our famous, or we made, I suppose, our famous um, restored painted version of the Peplos Parade that has obviously now been superseded by different restorations. That was the kind of um, peak point of a long period of painting the plaster cast to make them look more like stone. And it has that date and a signature by the chap that did the painting here, Lehrman, um, engraved on the back of it. And long had the committee wanted to, well, it wasn't really the committee, it was the um, curator at the time, R.M. Cook, long had he wanted to do a painted version of the Peplos Corrine. How do we know that? We know that because there's this letter knocking about in a filing cabinet in my office that talks of how on the 23rd of December, no, sorry, the 1st of January in uh, 1973, a strange crate arrived in Cambridge and no one knew what was in it and it wasn't addressed to anyone in particular and around it knocked about going to different places until someone said you know what we should just open it let's crack it open and inside was a plaster cast of the Peplos Corrie so ultimately it found its way to our museum and what you're looking at here is a letter from Cook to the vice chancellor to say so no one knows why we've got this, but maybe we can keep it because we'd quite like to paint one. Ultimately, he must have decided they didn't make sense to paint an unrestored one, so he got another one anyway. And also probably, so it turned out that this had been sent by the Greek Junta. It was um, a gift that had not been requested. So the, the, the sending of this cast is already heavily embroiled in kind of political um, interactions, I suppose, in unexpected ways, right? Who would expect this? So Kirk also says, you know, maybe, you know, probably one of us should write and say thank you. That's probably the diplomatic thing to do. And the vice chancellor said, yeah, do you know, you keep it. It's fine. It's good. Yeah, you keep it. But we didn't keep it for long because in 1977, we, in the great period when museums did museum swapsies, we swapped it with Edinburgh, for like some slide screens, but we didn't just set the cast was not enough because we did not believe the cast was of high enough quality to, on its own to, to like be a good swap for them. So we threw in a whole load of books and some slides too to get these slide screens that presumably are long gone. Um, so off it went to Edinburgh. And I believe if one looks at their website, you will find a picture that shows a cast of the Petros Corrie. And I suspect that that is this cast. I suspect also they probably have no record whatsoever, but that's an email I haven't sent yet, that it came to us, came from us, sorry, and of this lovely story that otherwise is just going to exist in like random boxes in my catalogue, right? So tracking back the provenance of plaster cast <coughs> is tricky in the absence of good records and uh, good indications of workshops and things. So how else can I do this? Uh, this is our cast of the Apollo Belvedere. It is currently residing in the v &A in the Refashioning Masculinities exhibition. There's a lovely picture from installation. Doesn't he look nice? I'm sure he looks way better now. The whole thing is actually in place. And while we were preparing this, while it was being conserved, um, a question arose about whether, whether certain joins in the cloak were joins or whether they might be breaks. They were joins. I was right all along. But this gave me a happy afternoon, wasn't happy, of desperately trying to look at pictures of other people's plaster casts of the Apollo Belvedere to see if we could compare and work out what these very straight and quite obviously joined lines were. Um, and the answer was no, we could not because every other single cast that I looked at the, the joins did not match up and most particularly the joins on the arms were the ones that did not match up. So it looks like that means that, you, of course, I know this, loads of workshops were producing casts of this object and they were all using different moulds and that results in different joins, right? But on that same day, as luck should have it, the cast collection in Lyon posted this on Instagram, which were pictures of them restoring their cast of the Apollo Belvedere because their cloak had broken long ago. And if you look closely, you can't really tell from my picture, sorry, it's a rubbish picture, but it's in the VNA, so I can't get a fresh one. Um, it, you can't really tell, but the joins on the arms are exactly the ones of mine. So my bet would be these come from the same moulds and possibly the same workshop. And that's another email that I need to send that future Suzanne's gonna do because today Suzanne hasn't done it yet. Um, but this is also indicative of Social media on the one hand allows us to make connections and it's great in my experience making connections with other collections and other curators. 
Most plaster cast collections, though, are not enormously well catalogued and often are not online and are not supported with brilliant photographs. <laughs> You've seen mine. Um, so doing this type of work, which is quite painstaking, is going to be even more painstaking until more people start putting their pictures online. And in fact, Leon, the reason why I can't look this up really easily is because they have a catalogue that is still from like the early 20th century, I think, mm. that they're working on. And their curator is currently on maternity leave. So I just need to wait for her to come back and then maybe we'll get somewhere. OK, so those are a lot of fun stories for you. But so what, right? Because my objects are just plaster casts. They're just copies. This seems like an awful lot of time and effort and energy, right, for just a bunch of fakes. We've already agreed that's what they are, haven't we? No, they're not fakes. Um, so what I want to finish with is thinking a little bit more about why, why provenance still matters, even in my collection, even though I'm not talking about objects that are two and a half thousand years old. Although in defense of my very historical plaster casts, I do think that any other object in the museum that is 200 plus years old, we would all be desperate actually to take good care of and know, know things about. But copies, the tricks in between, are often things that we place less value on or that fall you know, of secondary importance to the original artifacts in our collection. Still, all the same, there is something of um, an underground movement to reconsider these assessments that we, that we tend to place on plaster casts. On the one hand, it's certainly true that in research terms, plaster casts are definitely sexier than they were 20 years ago, right? Nonetheless, I would hazard a guess that the types of inquiries that I get about my collection are a, quite a different kind of um, type than the types of collections, types of queries that you might be getting about your collection. Um, and we've already seen how assumptions about value judgments have kind of shaped the record keeping of our collection. Value judgments that kind of see costs placed below in value from authentic objects. Nonetheless, the very concept of authenticity itself is one that is historically contingent and was developed at the end of the 19th century. It's at the very foundation of my museum as a museum in its own right is contingent upon that development too. But that's another story. Projects like the Replica Futures project in Stirling and Cars on the Table, um, I was involved in the production of these guidelines, so I have something of an investment in them, but not heavily involved. I really wasn't that important. I just sent some comments, that was all. Um, so projects like the Replica Futures project in Stirling are offering guidelines for rethinking how we might manage and curate copies in our collections. That's both historical copies and the making of new copies now and how we keep good records on them and how we continue to look after them. And central to their guidelines is that um, replicas are objects in their own right with their own stories and their own biographies. And central to understanding them as objects in their own right is understanding their life histories. So doing exactly this type of provenance research, it's that that brings these objects to life. And they say that here, the materi materiality, location, use, accessibility, social context, biography, technology, stroke, craft of production and authorship will all inform how authenticity is experienced and negotiated. And in fact, Sally and Sean would argue that there is an originality and an authenticity inherent in replicas too, and particularly one that grows up over time. And there are arguments about that are really, really interesting and have implications for how we understand collections of copies and our judgments about them. So with that in mind, our plan is for the work that we're doing to improve the information in the catalogue to directly impact the information that we tell visitors in the gallery through our labels. So what you see here is a contrast between our traditional labels, which tell you next to nothing about the plaster cast. See, there's the same in Kuros one. They tell you everything about the original. Okay, not everything, it's only a label, right? Um, and any information that might imply to you it's a cast or a copy is in that really small writing at the bottom where it mentions uh, where the original is, but it doesn't tell you what the significance of that information is. And what you see on the other side there, I want to say the left, it's the left to me, but it's not, is it? Um, is a new style of label that we've developed, a hierarchized label so that readers do not have to read the whole content should they not wish to. Uh, we like a wordy label in our museum. I feel like that's got something to do with us being a university museum, right? 
Um, but also you'll see at the top there, for the first time, our labels will give information about the, both the original and the plaster cast. And in essence, what that information is doing is almost like a shorthand object biography, right? In easy factoid form, where visitors could just glance at that and could both take away from this, that this is a plaster cast and can see the difference in date, the life history of these two objects, right? And I don't want to oversell this, but at the same time, I do think it's easy to underestimate um, what a departure this is, because we have never in the history of our collection given information about our objects as plaster casts. And I would hazard a guess that that is true for most plaster cast collections. So, OK, it's just a label. Um, but that information that was never important enough for our catalogue, let alone our labels, will now take centre stage in the gallery. But let's take another look at, at those maker's marks and what they represent. Because it's so easy, isn't it, to dismiss provenance in relation to plaster casts, because they're just stand-ins for absent originals. That's the reason they were collected, right? It's through a glass darkly. Um, but also because, like I said, it's really unlikely anyone's going to come knocking on the door and asking for them back. And it's like we get a, a like kind of get out of jail free card there, in a sense. But Historically, plaster cast production and supply is intimately connected with the self-same processes of nationalism and colonialism that led to the foundation of museums as repositories for national collections in the 19th century. They are the same processes. Plaster cast workshops usually represent national or nationalizing interests. They were founded by national museums to supply cast of the things in their collections or by the nations themselves. So let's look more closely here. The Gipsformer in Germany was founded by a king at the start of the 19th century. Um, so national, right? Nationalizing interests. Uh, the production of plaster cast in France, in Paris, and across the whole of France actually, is a national project. The Musée National de Large Atelier. In um, London, it was slightly different. Bretagne and company were private, but they were appointed by the government as the official suppliers of plaster casts in this country. In fact, actually, they took the government to, to court at one point to get that confirmed, that relationship confirmed. Um, they were appointed to supply plaster casts, a pre-agreed list of plaster casts through the grant system set up by the South Kensington Museum to uh, regional art schools. So it might be weird to think of plaster casts as part of an industrialising project, but that's exactly what they were in this country. They were about the education of the country with the skill sets that were needed to produce um, all the new kind of industrial things uh, in, in the Victorian age. Does that make sense? That's a really rubbish sentence there, but does that make sense? It's, it's really industrialised. So we shouldn't be fooled into thinking then that plaster casts sit outside the very networks of national identity of which we see so much problematization at the moment. The only reason that we have these plaster cast collections like this is because nations, nation states were producing them to amplify the reach of the sculptures in their care. And adjacent to, to this argument, which I'm making really quickly, um, is that that there are good arguments to say that the production of copies is one of the processes through which some sculptures were marked out as masterpieces and therefore more special. So actually, lots of the processes of understanding and identifying importance in the 19th century of classical sculptures are, you know, intimately linked to the production of plaster casts. And indeed, this, this means that re provenance research on plaster casts represents opportunities, opportunities beyond documentation backlog plans, because we're quite literally mapping out the geographic networks through which European museums took ownership of, or maybe rather took advantage of, the classical sculptures in their care. And all that data is sitting in those tiny little boxes in my brand new catalogue, right? A triangulation between where a sculpture was found, the collection that owns it today and where in the world that collection is, and then where a plaster cast of that, and possibly in the future, more plaster casts, because I can people my catalogue with whatever I want, more plaster casts. So we could quite literally map that out on a big giant map if I fill in all of those boxes at some point in the future. Thank you. <laughs>